Hello and welcome. My name is Camille Cameron, and for those of you who do not know, I'm the Dean of the Schulich School of Law. I'd like to welcome you all here, and I'd like to acknowledge that we're gathered here today for this event on unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. It's a real pleasure to be hosting this event, which is a combined FB Wickwire Lecture in Professional Responsibility and Ethics and the Osler, Hoskin, and Harcourt LLP Business Law Forum being held in association with the Purdy Crawford Workshop. Um, I'm going to, having now given you what I hope was a warm welcome, uh, introduce Tilly Pillay. Tilly Pillay QC is the Executive Director of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. Um, the Barrister Society have, with the law school over the years, been co-hosts of the Wickwire Lecture. Um, Tilly's going to come and say a few words about Ted Wickwire, the namesake, but before she does that, I will just say a few words, if I may, about Tilly. Um, Tilly, as I've said, is the executive director of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. She took up that role in January 2018. Uh, before that, she was executive director of legal services for the Nova Scotia Department of Justice, where she also served as acting deputy minister um, in 2015 and 2016. Uh, she began her career in litigation. Um, she worked first for legal aid and then she joined the Nova Scotia Department of Justice where she held various roles. I'm not going to also tell you about the, the amount of volunteer work she's done, but certainly over the years volunteer work has been a big part of her uh, profile. So I'm going to invite uh, Tilly Pillay to come up now to say a few words about Ted Wickwire. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that Eve Wickwire is here uh, today and is going to be listening to the lecture, so welcome, Mrs. Wickwire. Um, we have all encountered in our lives that special person, someone who has made a great impact on all of us. Ted Wickwire was such a person. He walked amongst us with purpose, humility, and grace. He, he was a consummate professional, he embodied all that we strive to be as lawyers, but more importantly, as human beings. He practiced and modeled the highest professional standards. His commitment to the legal profession and to his community was well known. So when Ted Wickwire passed away at the young age of 52, the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, an organization that greatly benefited from his wisdom and leadership, decided to honor his memory by creating this memorial lecture series in partnership with the law school. And thank you very much to the law school for joining us in this. The decision was made to have this lecture series focus on professional responsibility and legal ethics because Ted Wickwire championed professionalism and high ethical standards throughout his entire career. Ted was the society's chair of our first legal ethics committee and he oversaw the development of the Society's Handbook on Illegal Ethics and Professional Conduct. He also served as our president. His many contributions, and there's too many for me to say here today, like he was the first chair of the Legal Aid Commission. He had a report reviewing the conduct of lawyers in the Donald Marshall Jr. case. And he concluded that the judicial system had failed Donald Marshall Jr. throughout. It these contributions of his focused on his public interest. We are incredibly lucky to have had Ted Wickwire walk amongst us. We at the Society are so happy to have this opportunity to celebrate and honor him at this lecture series every year. Thank you for joining us. Hello everyone, many of you know me. I'm Professor Sarah Suck I'm here at the Schulich School of Law and I'm absolutely delighted uh, to have the opportunity today um, to feature a panel of four speakers, uh, all of whom I hold in the very highest regard and to share some thoughts with you on um, business responsibilities for human rights, sustainable development and, and contemplating the possible role um, of the business lawyer. This event, as um, Camille has noted, is a joint initiative supported by the Nova Scotia Barristers Society through the Wickwire Lecture and the Osler Hoskin Harcourt 
Business Law Forum. Um, and it is also the opening event of the Purdy Crawford Workshop, which this year has a focus on the role of business regulation in advancing the Sustainable Development Goals. According to the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, the private sector has an important role to play in implementation of the SDGs, and all businesses are called upon to apply their creativity and innovation to solving sustainable development challenges while also respecting human rights and the environment. And this panel is designed to serve as an opportunity to reflect on the potential for business lawyers to play a role in the promotion of respect for human rights and sustainability, and the potential role that regulators of the profession might also play in guiding and enabling that role. Since the late 1990s, there has been a proliferation of international normative instruments designed to guide bus responsible business conduct, often informed by international human rights law. So for example, in uh, the year 2000, the UN launched the Global Compact, which is a learning network through which businesses can align their operations with UN priorities by endorsing principles in relation to human rights, the environment, labor, and anti-corruption. And now, the UN Global Compact also provides guidance on how businesses can align their operations with the Sustainable Development Goals. And yet, our understanding of the relationship between these international guidance tools and the law, or even how we are to understand what the law is, uh, is arguably underdeveloped. And this has implications, I think, for how we understand the role of business lawyers. So an underlying theme for today is how lawyers advising business clients should understand the legal relevance of the independent responsibility of businesses to respect human rights, as established in 2011 under the UN Guiding Principles. This responsibility has subsequently been implemented into many international guidance tools that are promoted to businesses to implement throughout their operations. And indeed, Canada is actually mandated to promote the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, including a chapter on international human rights, um, as a member of the OECD. And it's also mandated to have a national contact point mechanism to which complaints can be brought about irresponsible business conduct, which takes, can be resolved in theory in the form of mediation um, and dialogue facilitation. The business responsibility to respect rights may also be implemented through domestic statutory law or through the evolution of doctrines in tort or integrated in contractual supply chains. And Canada has actively promoted this international responsible business conduct uh, guidance tools and continues to, to Canadian businesses operating outside of Canada as well as within Canada and has done so for a number of years. There's been a great deal of emphasis on the mining sector, which is often due to concerns over a failure to respect local and indigenous community rights, as well as increasingly a failure to consider uh, gender-based discrimination. Um, but increasingly, attention is turning to other industry sector contexts as well, such as the garment sector, following the Rana Plaza um, disaster tragedy in Bangladesh. Um, and new guidance from the OECD touches on agricultural supply chains, um, and starts to make reference to things like the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. The climate justice and business responsibilities for human rights are going to feature as a, as a subject of discussion through the Purdy Crawford workshop, um, but today uh, we're focused on a particular um, feature. What is the relationship between these business guidance tools, including those that embed respect for international human rights law, and the law? Codes of professional conduct for lawyers in Canada often speak, for example, of the competent lawyer. Must the competent lawyer be one that is knowledgeable of these tools and the relationship between these tools and the law? And what about integrity? So to better under, unravel this mystery, I'm delighted that we have with us today four international legal experts in business and human rights, responsible business conduct and sustainability. Um, and key point is that these issues are ones that confront business lawyers all over the world, um, and that they also have implications in the litigation context. What I'm going to do is to introduce each speaker in order, and each speaker will have 15 minutes to share their insights, and then we'll have time for some discussion. Our first speaker is John Sherman III, whose talk is titled, Good Corporate Lawyers Advise Clients on What Hard Law Says They Must Do. <laughs> 
but great corporate lawyers advise clients on what soft law says they should do. John is an internationally recognized expert on the role of corporate lawyers in implementing the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. He was a Deputy General Counsel for National Grid for 30 years, um, and he then became a senior legal advisor to Professor John Ruggie and helped him draft and shape the UN Guiding Principles. Um, since 2011, he's been General Counsel and Senior Advisor to SHIFT, um, which John Ruggie chairs. He's also chaired the International Bar Association Working Group that drafted the 2016 International Bar Association Practical Guide for Business Lawyers on Business and Human Rights, as well as a 2015 Guide for Bar Associations. Welcome, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. And I'm to, can't say how delighted I am to be here at this distinguished university on such a great panel. And I really look forward uh, not only to hear what my colleagues say, but to get questions from you. Now, I've been trying, when I started, I was trying to think of what's the right angle to get into the professional responsibility uh, and the ethical implications of advising on normative soft law values. And I decided that the best way to dial in is uh, this topic, which I'm going to talk about, which is contracting out of human rights. Uh, it's been around, it's a term that's been around for a while, but it has particular application today. So here's my argument. Uh, lawyers who represent businesses should not advise their clients to contract out of their responsibility to respect human rights. And that responsibility, as Sarah said, derives from the 2011 UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. It is a soft law norm, but it is a soft law norm with a hard bite. Rather, my argument is that businesses should advise their clients to try to achieve the right balance between protecting their clients' legal interests and respecting human rights. Make no mistake, doing that is not easy at all. But in the end, I think it is worthwhile for both uh, business clients, lawyers, and society. So what is the rationale for advising on soft law norms? Model 2.1 of the American Bar Association's Rules of Professional Conduct says it pretty well. And I'll quote, advice couched in narrow legal terms may be of little value to a client, particularly where practical considerations such as costs and the effects on other people are predominant. Purely technical legal advice, therefore, can sometimes be inadequate. It goes on to say that although a lawyer is not a moral advisor as such, Moral and ethical considerations impinge on most legal questions and may decisively influence how the law will be applied. Now, this isn't a radical position. Experienced lawyers often advise, uh, point out the reputational and ethical uh, risks of engaging in very complex financial transactions, even where those uh, transactions would pass technical legal muster, think Enron. The same should apply to the client when considering the soft law human rights implications of a particular transaction. Soft law on human rights. At the center of the soft law galaxy is the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, drafted by Professor John Ruggie, uh, who was the special representative of the UN Secretary General. And the UN Human Rights Council unanimously endorsed them in 2011. That followed a six-year process of pilot projects, research, and dozens of multi-stakeholder uh, uh, pilot projects. They operationalize uh, Ruggie's Protect, Respect, and Remedy framework, which provides that states have a duty to protect human rights, businesses, have a responsibility to respect human rights, and there's a need for greater access to remedy. And these have become the authoritative global standard on business and human rights. They have cascaded 
far beyond their origins in the United Nations and are increasingly reflected in law, multi-stakeholder norms, the policies and practices of leading companies, and the advocacy of civil society. Now, of critical relevance to the contracting out of human rights is the concept of human rights due diligence. This is articulated in the business responsibility to respect human rights, which is the second pillar. The responsibility to respect applies to all businesses. It is not limited to lo local law, and it is not a voluntary sign-up. It's an ongoing process conducted through the lens of the affected stakeholder. It requires businesses to show, to know what their risks are and show how they're addressing them. And it requires, one, identifying the risks, two, responding in an integrated fashion to those risks, three, uh, tracking their performance, and four, being prepared to communicate. It also expects that businesses will provide remedy to stakeholders uh, who have been harmed where the business causes or contributes to that harm. Now, there is a strong business case to conduct human rights due diligence in order to avoid the risks of involvement in human rights abuse. And as a rule of thumb, you can, you can figure that the more severe the risk uh, uh, to the stakeholder, uh, the more likely it is that the risk to the stakeholder and the risk to co the company will, will converge. Now, the risks include non-legal risks, such as disruption and delay in bringing products to market, lost opportunity costs, management dis uh, distraction, unfavorable treatment in capital markets, divestment, and damage to reputation. But there are also legal risks. You can have claims legal claims by injured persons, class actions, breach of contractual commitments to important business partners, failure to, to disclose the risks to stakeholders and, and, and shareholders as required by modern slavery laws in, in many countries. Violation of mandatory uh, due diligence laws is also an issue, and those kinds of laws have been enacted in France, in Switzerland, in the Netherlands, and are currently uh, under consideration in the EU, Finland, um, Switzerland, and Germany. So what's the, what are lawyers to have to do all, with all of this, business lawyers? In its 2018 report to the uh, UN General Assembly, the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights addressed the role of lawyers. And here's what it said. And I'm quoting, business lawyers have a unique position for shaping the path that an enterprise may take. Often they are seen as one of the main obstacles to adopting effective human rights due diligence with a traditionally narrow focus on legal risk. It goes on to say, quote, law firms and bar associations should integrate human rights risk management in line with the UN guiding principles as a core element of the role of business lawyers as wise counselors. And in so saying, the, uh, the report referred uh, specifically to the IBA's 2016 practical guide on, uh, for business lawyers on, on business and human rights. And as Sarah said, I chaired a group of 11 international uh, legal experts who drafted that guide. The guide discusses the role of lawyers as both practical legal experts who, who tell their clients what the law says it can do and what it can't do, and wise counselors who advise the client on what might be the right thing to do in the company's sustainable long-term interest. To put it another way, Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, said just this last week, businesses have to stop the approach of saying, it's legal, therefore it's acceptable. So how does this apply to the practical work of business lawyers in advising clients on contracts and agreements? Uh, I'd like to give you two contrasting approaches, the protectionist approach and the collaborative approach. Now, the protective approach, which I call the guard, lawyer as guard dog, is intended to protect the client from legal liability for involvement in human rights problems 
by contracting the problem away, by offloading its responsibilities on the other party. For example, assume that a company doesn't want to read about modern slavery and child labor in its supply chain on social media for the first time. So it asks its lawyers for help in drafting the contract. Now the lawyer acting as guard dog will draft a contract that negates the buyer's uh, obligation to, to accept goods that are made with child labor or modern slavery. Pretty good. But at the same time, in order to protect the client, the contract would further uh, provide that the con contractual responsibility for any problems ends up in the, in, in the hands of the supplier. It, it effectively washes its hand. And that's close to what the American Bar Association is uh, considering in its initial modern slavery supply contracts. But this is in tension with the guiding principles which provide that human rights due diligence is the re responsibility of each entity. It can't be contracted out. Let me give you an example. Sarah talked about it earlier. Where suppliers lack the capacity to live up to the contract's human rights standards, the threat of contractual, oh dear, <laughs> five minutes, the threat of contractual penalties may incentivize suppliers to cheat or use unauthorized uh, subcontractors. And the classic example is the fas fast fashion model uh, in the apparel industry, uh, which ultimately led to first tier suppliers of, of, uh, of garment manufacturers uh, to, to go to, uh, that ultimately led to the Rana Plaza factory collapse in 2014, which killed over 1,100 workers. Human Rights Watch calls this paying for a bus ticket and expecting to fly. Now the alternative approach which I call the guide dog approach, recognizes the need to try to find the right balance between legal protection and the unpleasant consequences of violating soft law norms. In this case, the guide dog would try to use the contract to protect the lawyer from legal risks, but it would also integrate human rights due diligence into the contract for collaborative negotiation. And that approach derives from something called the principles for responsible contracts, that was an addendum to the UN Guiding Principles addressed to negotiators, including lawyers, of, uh, of, of agreements between foreign investors and host states. Um, the special representative focused on these contracts because they sit at the intersection of the state's duty to protect human rights and the business responsibility to respect. There are 10 contract principles and they include the need to identify, to identify upfront what are the most likely human risks to assign responsibility for addressing them uh, to community engagement through the life of, of the contract and grievance mechanisms. In other words, the contract, this kind of contract doesn't treat human rights as the responsibility of one side or the other, but recognizes the joint responsibility of both sides to create an agreement uh, that respects human rights. And that's far more likely to actually reduce the likelihood of human rights harm than attempting to contract out human rights. So let me sum up. I'm almost out of time. My position is that soft law norms, uh, such as human rights due diligence, are highly relevant when it comes to advising on contracts that may involve a client in human rights harm. Therefore, lawyers who advise businesses should, should, should be sensitive not to contract out human rights harm, but strive to achieve the right balance between protecting their clients' legal rights on the one hand and integrating human rights due diligence into, con into contract negotiation on the other. Doing so is much more likely to help the client avoid involvement in human rights harm in the first place. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and thank you for keeping so beautifully to the time as well. <laughs> Our second speaker, Penelope Simons, um, the title of her talk is Defending Corporations in Transnational Human Rights Cases in Canada, Professional Responsibility, Sustainable Development, and the Responsibility to Respect Human Rights. Uh, Penelope is, I 
was reminded just before the talk, a graduate of this very law school. Um, she is also an associate professor and uh, vice dean research at the Faculty of Law, Common Law at the University of Ottawa. Um, her research focuses on the human rights implications of business activity, and she's published widely in this area with a particular focus on, extractive, on the extractive sector. She was also co-counsel for the Interveners, Amnesty International, and the International Commission of Jurists in the Araya and Nevson case, um, and in 2018 was the winner of the Walter S. Tarnopolsky Award, which annually recognizes a resident of Canada who has made an outstanding contribution to human rights, domestically or internationally. Welcome, Penelope. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, thank you, first, for organizing this panel and continuing this very important discussion on the ethical and professional responsibilities of lawyers and SDGs. And thank you all for welcoming me to the, uh, to the university. It's great to be back. I'm pretty sure I took um, business organizations or business associations, I think we call it here, in this classroom with uh, Don Russell, who's a former dean of, the, uh, of, of this faculty. Um, uh, I'm, I've been working just on this paper, and it's in its sort of emerging stages, as it were, uh, with a colleague of mine who works on professional responsibility, who some of you may know is Amy Salazen. Um, and uh, as Sarah mentioned, I had the honor of representing Amnesty Interna International and the International Commission of Jurists uh, as a uh, co-counsel, as an intervener in the Supreme Court uh, case hearing of the Araya or Area and Nevson case, which is a case against Canadian extract companies that was heard last January. Um, it was certainly an eye-opening experience to be in the Supreme Court and to hear firsthand all the arguments that were put forward by uh, all parties and the interveners. But I was particularly struck by some of the arguments that were put forward by Council for Nevs and Resources on, on one of the motions. Uh, this is a case, for those of you who don't know, uh, about some of the most egregious violations of human rights. And it was brought by Eritrean refugees in the BC courts against the Canadian mining company Nevs and Resources. Uh, and they alleged that the corporation was complicit in, among other things, torture, forced labor, and slavery in Eritrea um, in, in relation to the development of the Bisha gold mine uh, that was developed by Nevson subsidiary. Uh, and Nevson brought a range of preliminary motions in this case, and this is very typical of this type of litigation, to try and get it um, uh, dismissed uh, at the early stages before it's heard on the merits. Uh, they brought a uh, motion for form non convenance to stay the proceedings on the basis that Eritrea was the most appropriate jurisdiction to try the case, and they lost on that. Um, they brought a motion to dismiss the case for act of state, um, and a motion to strike uh, the case uh, because part of the plaintiff's came, uh, claim was based in customary international law. They were trying to, they want to create a new sort of law uh, or, or um, cause of action uh, based on uh, the prohibition against torture, the prohibition against forced labor, and the prohibition against slavery. Now, in the BC courts, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court of British Columbia dismissed all three of the defendants' motions. And when we got to the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal agreed. And so uh, Nevson appealed two of those motions up to the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, and so the two of the motions that they appealed, the first, well, the second one, but the first one I'm going to mention, was that the claim should be uh, partially, should be struck because uh, there's no cause of action to partially base the claim in customary international law. And this motion, of course, raised a very important legal question of whether these peremptory norms, which are automatically part of the law of Canada as customary international law, are actionable in themselves. Um, the second motion that was raised was the act of state motion. And that's, that's, uh, that's a common law doctrine that actually has never been applied in Canada in the Canadian courts um, that is basically this idea that you should not uh, hear a claim when um, uh, there's, a, there's an act of, of a sovereign state that is implicated in, in, in the claim itself. And so what they were arguing was that, that it's Eritrea's acts that were against the law in this case, and, we should, and, the, and the court should decline to uh, hear the case because of that. But a number of arguments that were made by counsel in this latter motion on act of state were not only unconvincing, but uh, seemed, at least in my view, to be close to the line of a mischaracterization of international law, of domestic case law, and of, uh, even of the case that was being pleaded by the, case, uh, the plaintiffs. Um, so for example, they argued that the case should have been dealt with uh, in international tribunals like the International Criminal Court, that the plaintiffs should have brought a claim against the state in the International Criminal Court. Well, of course, 
there's no jurisdiction of the court to try uh, states, and individuals can't uh, bring a claim uh, in the same way. So uh, I won't go into the other details, but I'm happy to talk about them later. These types of lawsuits are very important because access to justice for victims of business-related human rights violations um, uh, are, are an ongoing global concern. And there are a few mechanisms that, through which uh, victims of these violations can actually seek redress and bringing claims in host states like Canada, for example, uh, against extractive companies that are Canadian is one of the only means for holding these companies accountable at this time. Um, now, the problem with these claims is that there are a host of very well-known practical, legal, and also <coughs> structural barriers to bringing them. So, for example, practical barriers would include the cost of litigation, the lack of legal aid, difficulty in finding a lawyer to, who can bring these claims. Um, there's no specific cause of action, some of the legal barriers uh, uh, for this, so you have to try and, and fit the harms, like uh, torture, slavery, and uh, um, uh, forced labor into torts, which is, is a bit difficult. They don't always represent the harm that's been caused. Of course, uh, corporate structures pose a problem, the doctrines of separate legal personality and limited liability to the liability of the parent corporation, and there's always the question of jurisdiction. Is Canada the appropriate place to hear this claim? Um, and or is, should it be more appropriately heard in another, another country. Um, and transnational, in terms of structural barriers, the plaintiffs, of course, are often very vulnerable, marginalized uh, people. Uh, they can be refugees, uh, women, children, indigenous peoples from other countries. Uh, and transnational corporate groups, of course, are able to kind of play with the jurisdiction because they operate across jurisdictions um, through uh, different e legal entities. So the other thing is that defending these motions is very expensive. So you spend the first part of the, the first few years trying to keep the, the, the claim in the courts, and it can be very costly, particularly when these motions are um, brought all the way up to the highest court of the land. So I want to talk. Uh, I want to kind of look at four questions. I'm hoping I have more than five minutes at this point. Um, uh, four questions. First of all, does the conduct of, of the lawyers who represent extractive companies as defendants in a civil suit like this comply with the traditional view of how lawyers should conduct themselves in adversarial contexts? Um, and then, do the guiding principles on business and human rights and the sustainable development guidelines speak to this responsibility and require lawyers to adjust their conduct in these types of cases? And then what are the existing constraints on the model of, of advocacy, which is the zealous or red, resolute advocate? And is there a case uh, to be made for adopting a different approach to these types of claims uh, and modifying this re resolute or zealous advocacy model, uh, drawing an analogy with other approaches that have been adopted in Canada, for example, with respect to litigation by governments against Indigenous peoples, and also um, litigation involving self-represented lit litigants. So that's a lot to, uh, to try and stuff in, so I'm just going to uh, just make a few points on it. But first of all, um, as many of you probably know, if you've studied professional responsibility, uh, the uh, dominant model of adversarial lawyering is one of the zealous or resolute uh, advocate. And so what does that mean? Well, there is a case uh, from 1820 defending Queen Caroline uh, from a charge of adultery that was brought by her husband. Um, that says, an advocate in the discharge of his duty knows but one person in the world, and that person is his client, to save that client by all means and expedience and at all hazards and costs to other persons, and among them to himself is his first and only duty. And in performing this duty, he must not regard the alarm, the torments, the destruction which he may bring upon others. So that is a very you know, uh, I guess, uh, sort of zealous uh, advocate <laughs> that, is, that is captured by that. But it has been cited by the Supreme Court of Canada, and it is, um, it is kind of recognized in the professional, uh, the model of professional conduct. Um, this idea that the lawyer has to place their interests, the interests of the client above those of other people, and the, the interests of the client above his or her own or their own. So if we look at the Federation of Law Societies model code of conduct, we can see that this is reflected in there. In adversarial proceedings, a lawyer has a duty to raise, um, duty to the client to raise fearlessly every issue, advance every argument, and ask every question, however distasteful that the lawyer thinks will help the client's case to endeavor to obtain for the client the benefit of every re remedy and defense authorized by law. So the next question is, uh, where do the guiding principles and the sustainable development goals fit in? 
do they impose some sort of responsibility on counsel defending corporations in these types of claims? And, and what is the relationship between these guidelines and obligations of professional responsibility? Well, uh, we've heard from um, John Sherman uh, that law firms do have some responsibility to respect human rights throughout their business activity. But in the context of lawyers as advocates, it seems that uh, this seems to be, th there's a different perspective, uh, and, for, and for some very good reasons. Um, but the, the Interna International Bar Association Practical Guide on the Guiding Principles says that uh, nothing in this uh, in the guiding principles or in the practical guide should be read to restrict the rights of clients to ensure a robust defense to, for such claims or to seek judicial determination of human rights related issues. And if we look at um, the guiding, the uh, sustainable development, um, sustainable SDGs, <laughs> yes, the SDGs, <laughs> Number 16.3, five minutes, okay. Um, it calls on all actors to promote the rule of law at the national and international level, levels and ensure access to justice for all. So how do you balance then the international right uh, to an effective remedy, which includes access to an effective remedy, so getting to the merits of the case potentially, and an effective remedy, um, uh, and, and getting an effective remedy, and then the right of businesses to independent counsel when they are, um, are charged with uh, these types of, uh, or, or sued for these types of abuses. Well, there are certain constraints in um, the professional responsibility guidelines. Um, uh, counsel are supposed to discharge the duty by fair and honorable means without illegality in a manner that is consistent with a lawyer's duty to treat the tribunal with candor. However, also, a lawyer should avoid and discourage the client from resorting to frivolous or vexation obje vexatious objections and when acting as an advocate, a lawyer must not uh, knowingly deceive a tribunal or influence the course of justice by misstating facts or law. Now, I'm not reading the whole, I'm just sort of reading the things that I think apply. Um, or knowingly misstate the substance of an argument. So it's hard to say based on, on how the councils conducted themselves, you know, do they fall foul of these rules or not? It would appear that they were really raising fearlessly every issue and advancing every argument and asking every question. Um, so even though some of those arguments might be close to the line. Uh, so there, there are some people who've thought a lot about, you know, this, the adversarial, adversarial system. And Tim Dar Dare has said uh, that there is a distinction between a zealous lawyer and a hyperzealous lawyer. Where <laughs> a zealous lawyer is someone who's partisan in the sense that they bring out all of their professional skills to bear upon the task of securing their client's rights but under no obligation to pursue the interests that go beyond the law. A hyperzealous lawyer is concerned not merely with securing his client's interests or her client's interests, but to pursue any advantage obtainable for her client through the law. So it's still, it's still not clear um, uh, uh, whether or not uh, the, the Nevson Council, as I saw it, actually would, would be considered a, a zealous or a hyperzealous, perhaps hyperzealous. But, but that doesn't bring us really any closer to the question because, uh, because it would still be hard to find them in violation of the, of the professional rules. So I think a way forward, rather than trying to, to look to the guiding principles and the uh, sustainable development goals to, uh, to stress uh, different ways of acting for lawyers in this context of litigation, would be to look at the uh, legal and moral obligations on Canada and, and states like Canada uh, including their provincial and territorial governments um, to provide an effective remedy for foreign victims of violations of human rights that are perpetrated by uh, corporations from that jurisdiction, so Canadian corporations. And this would include removing some of the obstacles to bring these types of claim, creating a cause of action beyond a traditional tort, um, uh, to reflect things like uh, grave violations of human rights, for example, asserting that Canada has jurisdictions over the claims, and maybe creating a rebuttable presumption uh, that, that uh, the Canadian courts are the appropriate jurisdiction, like they do in Australia. Introducing legislation that would prevent uh, motions like act of state being brought, or comity in cases where a Canadian extractive company is, uh, has been operating in a foreign state. Uh, in light of the importance of access to justice, we really, really still need to question where, whether the model of robust adversarial litigation is appropriate. And I think we could look, draw some analogies from changes that have been made um, in terms of litigation involving Indigenous peoples. 
and the Attorney General's directive in that regard, and the guidelines that have been produced by a variety of law societies, as well as the Supreme Court's decision uh, in Pineta and Johns on the obligations of courts in dealing with uh, self-represented litigants and also uh, the discourse around the conduct of lawyers in these contexts and, and sharp practice. Um, in transnational corporations, uh, transnational uh, litigation, we're dealing with some of the most vulnerable and marginalized plaintiffs, and I think that there is an argument uh, that we do need to treat these differently in this context. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Penelope. Our next speaker is Larry Katabacher, whose talk is Sustainability, Corruption, and Compliance, the Role of the Lawyer in Institutional Frameworks and Corporate Transactions. Larry is the W. Richard and Mary Eshelman Faculty Scholar and Professor of Law and International Affairs at Penn State University. His work touches on the regulation of multinational corporations, sovereign wealth funds, transnational constitutionalism, and the convergence of public and private law. He teaches a semester-long course on corporate social responsibility that seeks to align issues of sustainability with those of philanthropy and human rights. And he's also associated with the Coalition of Peace and Ethics and runs an academic blog called Law at the End of the Day, which I highly recommend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and thank you very much for, for sticking around. Um, uh, John and Penelope are impossible acts to follow. So rather than try to do that, which I am not going to do, I'm going to give you eye candy. Um, not me, this. Um, so as, as I try to talk through some issues that, that are going to be um, much more abstract um, as you get uh, disoriented or bored or uh, just look at the pretty pictures and, and try to figure out what I'm doing. There's, there's also... Uh, um, there, there's a method to this madness as well. I do a lot of work in semiotics, and, and that teaches us, if anything else, about the, the critical importance of signaling in pictures. And a lot of times what you say and what you see can be quite distinctive things, or sometimes they can align. And, and as I walk through this uh, presentation, I want you to think about that uh, in terms of the pretty pictures that I put up or the pretty amalgamations of colors that, that, that you're going to see, um, all of which ultimately relate to the, the fundamental questions that we're talking about, which is ethics and ultimately um, the fundamental question of ethics is a question of your own sense of self and your own autonomy within series of overlapping complex relationships. And that's ultimately where we're going to, not to slavery to a particular uh, law or code, not to obligation to a particular master who may or may not be paying you or enough, um, but to yourself. Uh, and that ultimately is, is where we're going to start. So I've, I've now shown you three pictures. You probably are trying to figure out what they are. And three pictures, all of which deeply go into structures of ethics, none of which go to the structures of ethics that you might have wanted us to start with, start with, which is probably the most narrow and from my perspective, the most irrelevant of them because they're merely issues of compliance and that's the professional rules of conduct. We all love them and we all abide them, but that's hardly the beginning of what you wind up doing or being as an, as an ethical lawyer. I've shown you pictures of the old ways in Africa and African thinking about ethics and the relationship of people to their surroundings. I've shown you pictures, I've always, I, I love the top one, of, of, of Moses and Paul, uh, their uh, cousins separated at birth in a, in a sense, uh, frenemies, but give, coming from a very different tradition. Um, and of course, uh, a condomble ceremony for Yemanya, in uh, who is the manifestation, I don't like using the English term, the manifestation of, uh, there's a lot of ways of looking at it, but of the female, of the oceans, of the vast underlying, the, the, the Chinese yin, um, in the context of figuring out 
who and where you are in their relationship and you're going, what is this crazy man doing talking about all of this stuff? How is he going to bring this back into what I have to do when a client calls me up and asks me to do something that's really kind of smelly? We'll get there, we'll get there. But I want you to start thinking about this because when you start talking about ethics, you, you generally, you, me, I generally take for granted the starting point. And so the, the first couple of slides is to remind you that the starting point is actually quite contingent. And not only contingent, but the starting point is multiple. And that one has to be very careful about how one aligns one morals and ethical starting point with what one does in relation to oneself to one's clients, one's adversary, the state and stakeholders. And so when you look at ethics, you're looking at right conduct, but right conduct is unmoored until you moor it. And you either moor it because you must or because you should or because you want to. But in that mooring of right conduct, I, I could have taken you back to Justinian's Institute, which is where I, I like starting this stuff. But students just go crazy if, if I'm talking about a seventh century uh, Byzantine emperor and I, and I just lose you. So I'm, I'm doing it this way instead, right? It's right conduct. But when you think about ethics as right conduct, you're really talking about a number of things. Um, and I, I just put a couple of them up. I'm not going to read through this. There's almost nothing more excruciating than reading your own PowerPoints. Uh, you can look at this as I babble uh, on about this. You're looking at ethics as norms, right? You're looking at moral principles and value systems, including those which in developed states we've traditionally tended to marginalize, but which are vibrant and important and in global production may actually predominate in the way in which you think about not merely conduct, but sustain, issues of sustainability, issues of community, and ultimately issues of human rights. So we're looking at ethics as norms and moral principles. This is the happy land that you all tend to, to live in in the university and the law schools, which as you can see for me is just a tiny component of what you ought to be looking at as an ethical lawyer, and that's ethics as compliance the mandatory obligation of a particular set of behaviors that's usually mandated by the state or by your professional organizations or through your, by the state through your professional organizations. We can quibble about how all that works, right? And it goes to the structures of compulsion and implicates the question of scope and especially important when you are working beyond your own particular compliance unit dealing with issues of ethics beyond the reach, in your case in Canada, of the Canadian rules of professional conduct. You're working in Nigeria, you're working in Bangladesh, you're working in Honduras. Whose ethical mandatory codes ought you to be looking at as in when you advise from whose perspective? And so this gets complicated as well. And it brings us to the, the, the next point, which is ethics as responsibility, not merely as codes, not merely as self-awareness, not merely as systems, but actually as a system of, of responsibility, intranormative communication is at its heart and the responsibility to first become aware of it and then to figure out whether or to what extent to align it and then especially if you sit and eventually all of you will if God willing or some reasonable facsimile thereof you all wind up sitting somewhere as an executive vice president of compliance or a CEO you're going to have to worry about how you implement all of this thing and make into a coherent process when you are presiding over complex systems of combinations of control and contract uh, that manages large global production chains all over, well, I'm being redundant, but global production chains all over the place, uh, right? And then ultimately, you're looking, all of this becomes ethics as a duty, uh, extending beyond compliance. If you, if you think about nothing else after I get done, and I'm, I'm only at the beginning of the slides, but I'm probably not gonna finish them. But anyway, so I'm gonna give you the, the clue. The only thing you should think about at the end of this is when you think about ethics, you think about ethics as a duty rather than as a compulsion. To what extent does it or ought to extend beyond compliance? Whose ethics are you applying? Whose duty 
to whom do you have a duty and how is it manifested? And it's only in that context that you can understand your relationship as a Canadian lawyer to the Canadian Professional Responsibility Code or mine as an American lawyer to the professional rules that, that, uh, to which I am responsible for, but only in part given the nature and scope of my own duties and my own representation, right? And all of this, of course, becomes clear. I'm not making this stuff up. Lawyers who are making money and people who are making money off of lawyers in this case. I just pulled this up. There's a million of these. This is the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium. Remind you that what used to be the simple thing that we like to teach you in law school about lawyers uh, and their relationship with clients has now become not only a business, but it has become a web of objectives and relationships that far exceed the simple thing. I want to exploit this person. And you say, OK, it'll cost you $10,000 in a retainer. And I'll figure out a way to do it, of course. Penelope tells us that that's a bad thing. And and we know that there are ways of doing this well. And John tells us, I'm, I'm going to be right. No, I, you know, but how you deal with this? Well, now it's really part of a lot of stuff. We're managing, we're vendor management. I don't want to go there, but I do. I can't resist pointing out the ethics of data and data management. You are no longer just serving a client. You are managing huge streams of data, especially when you sit at the apex of global production chains. And your ethical obligation to them may well be legal, but extends well beyond it. These are all things you wind up having to think about. And so the role of the lawyer is not the simple-minded, I give you money and you sue someone. It's now embedded not just geographically across spaces, but it is embedded deeply in a very transformative, uh, in, in the way in which law itself and the role of the lawyer within economic activity as a gatekeeper or not has itself been transformed over the course of a long time. Now you have to figure out which one you are in all of this. Y'all like to think of yourselves as this dude in the hat, but you may well be these folks over here who are about to get their heads sliced. Um, query, um, this, this maybe should stay with you. So what is the role of the lawyer, right? You normally look at sources, and we've already talked this to death. I just note it again. Um, I'll make the PowerPoints available to everyone. These are hot links, and you can go and look at them if, you are, if you're interested in the American sources. Um, my guess is that you're less interested in the Canadian, but it's what I do, so there you go. Um, you can take a look at them. These aren't as simple and straightforward as, as you might think. You've got, and we've already mentioned the sell it. I got five minutes. We'll see if we can do this, right? You've got the zealous uh, representation, scope of representation, but you've got a role as an advisor because not only are you representing your client, but you are an advisor and you are a social agent as well. And even the mandatory compliance rules of ethics will layer your response. So what kind of challenges do we have? I'll do this for five minutes and then uh, race through the, the rest. It's all, it's, it's all just derivative. So here are your challenges, right? Compliance and risk management and ethics. Are you looking at business risk? Are you looking at legal risk? Do you have the choice anymore in a world in which business risk may inevitably lead to legal risk? It's hard for me to tell the difference anymore. And it's hard for me to figure out in terms of ethics whether there's a different ethics for them, whether there's a unitary ethics, or whether the ethics changes in the context of, con in, in the context of where and to whom I'm giving advice. The geek, uh, gatekeeper autonomy and multiple sites of ethics, we've talked about this. Again, the ethical obligations of clients versus the ethical obligations of lawyers. You are not bound by your client's ethical obligations, but neither are you free of your own. And they may be different, and that may require a mediation of multiple points of ethics, right, down a production chain, across uh, uh, across representational boundaries and the like, which we tend to ignore, which causes a, a great set of conundrums, right? The scope of representation issues is, again, defined by the boundaries of legal forms rather than by control relationships. We, we have whined ourselves to death about to who we represent in terms of we represent the corporation and the subsidiaries. Do we have ethical obligations with respect to those in a control relationship from the perspective of human rights and uh, sustainability? The answer is increasingly yes. From the traditional perspective of the proper deed role of lawyers and ethics, the answer would be a horrified no. That's changing. You ought to think about it. 
the limits of agency, right? At what point does a lawyer's role change from that of advisor to principal? If you're in California, that becomes a live issue all the time because one wrong word, one wrong move, you stop being the lawyer and you are now a co-conspirator. In other places, you have protection. That changes, and it changes even more where human rights and sustainability imposes positive obligations on you with respect not only to your principal client, but with respect to the stakeholders who may or may not have an interest in the actions that ultimately produce harm somewhere within the field of action that may ultimately impact your client. How does that work? The difference, and this is especially important in the context of complicity and corruption and becomes tinged with public functions when it's a government that you're dealing with at the wrong end of the ethical conundrum. And then, of course, my big thing is the lawyer is a social and moral agent. Uh, you are not in the business of being a tool. You are a social and moral agent who is autonomous or ought to be autonomous of those who pay you money or those for whom you work for no money. Um, and that has significant implications well beyond the role, the simple role of uh, compliance. And so what does that all mean in terms of what I'm looking at? Sustainability, what I've done here is taken all of these abstract issues and then apply that in a series of concrete situations. The first is sustainability. There are a number of ethical issues. Which goals? I can tell you that, uh, for example, the Norwegian state on enterprise hydro will take a look at this, reduce these to five, and then rank order them, and then allocate resources on the basis of those that they have chosen, which align with their business model and the politics of the Norwegian state. I've got one minute, we'll do this, right? Uh, which goals, the, uh, are they ordered? Do they align with business and legal risk interpretation? We've got corruption, one of my personal favorites, uh, and I'm sure you all are following this baby here. You all know about that. Yeah. <laughs> but this becomes even more interesting, the, the uh, Lavalin case, not only because it's state corporate, you've got intracorporate, you've got the effectiveness of compliance system and complicity. What we talk, what we fail to talk about in corruption cases is complicity. And then for me, the big one that I want you to focus on when you're looking at corruption, everyone loves talking about corruption when you are giving money to the Qaddafi family. No one likes talking about corruption when you pay off your suppliers. Intra-corporate, intra-supply chain corruption is as ethically pregnant as the thing that is the subject of public law. Ought that to have ethical implications as well? I think the answer is yes. My favorite picture, you all know who this guy is. If you haven't seen this movie, you must, right? And the question is how you work it in institutional frameworks. Again, you're looking at the accountability, you're looking at monitoring, and ultimately in corporate transactions. How does this all work when you have ethics silos, when you have uh, uh, human rights that may be pushing you in a different direction? And then, sorry, this is for Sarah. Uh, how, what does climate have to do with all of this? And here you have an ethical obligation to act proactively. The uh, ethics rules are not a shield. They are a sword that has been put in your hands and climate and sustainability has made that absolutely clear. You're going to see it five years from now, but I can tell you right now that that is the case. And, and I'll end with this, if I may, the summary. It's just very simple. Uh, and again, this is the only other thing I'd ask you to remember from all of this stuff. Lawyers are not algorithms. Lawyers are not algorithms. You are instead moral beings who are deeply embedded in you, the societies you serve. You should wake up every morning and recite that, sort of like a catechism to remind you as you get dirty uh, over the course of the day, that that is you. You are not an algorithm, you are not a tool, you are a moral being. The nature of that service for which you get paid is bounded by the expectations which are autonomous of those with which other actors are burdened, and to that extent lawyers can't see themselves as a moral tools, but only, and they can be utilized by social actors to protect and advance their interests, but only within the constraints of the social order to which they owe their highest, you owe your highest fidelity, Within the bounds of that fidelity, everything is possible. Outside of the bounds of that fidelity, and this is the ultimate goal of ethics, outside of that, of those boundaries, nothing is available. And those boundaries are defined by the social orders, not by your clients, right? And the, thus, the ethical duties of lawyers flow to clients, flow to clients, and not from, and from the social order. I leave you with that. I'm out of time. Thank you very, very much.
Thank you, Larry. And from the, I can't multitask. <laughs> from Larry's excellent theoretically dense in some ways <laughs> talk, we will move, and Larry is like totally my favorite. We will move to Brigitte, who is also my favorite. <laughs> um, I'm incredibly grateful actually to Brigitte for coming here. She is, her talk is entitled The Corporate Social Responsibility of the Legal Profession, European Perspective. Um, Brigitte is an of counsel at Denton's Europe LLP, an associate professor at the University of Bremen, where she in international business law and business ethics. And the focus for her current practice research and teaching is on business and human rights, uh, CSR, and international environmental law. She was previously a partner in one of uh, the leading German law firms in the regulatory and environment department. And she is chair of the compliance and CSR committee of the German Lawyers Association, past chair of the CSR committees of the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, and the International Bar Association. She's also a member of the CSR and Anti-Corruption and Energy and Environment Commissions of the International Chamber of Commerce. And I'm incredibly grateful to Brigitte to, for coming here to share the European perspective. This is something that um, a number of us have actually spoken about um, at, in Geneva at the Business and Human Rights Forum, which is where many of us actually met for the first time. And so, Brigitte, thank you so much for coming and sharing your expertise. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah, for this kind introduction and invitation to come here. Um, I'm speaking today with the attorney's hat on, and I think it will be, and I think this is, was your request, Sarah, that it should be also kind of uh, be a specific position uh, adding to complementary to the positions we've just heard. And it should be also a summary of uh, what we have discussed uh, at the Council of Bars and Law Societies in Europe. John said good corporate lawyers advise clients on what hard law says what they must do, and, but great corporate lawyers advise clients on what soft law says what they should do. And a brilliant lawyer, she, that's of course a she, yeah. advises clients in addition on the intricate relationship between soft and hard law. Why is she brilliant? Because as an attorney, she cannot refer, and also as an in-house counsel, by the way, she cannot refer usually to a disclaimer, like many CSR and human rights consultancies do, for example, the Global Reporting Initiative, which exclude any professional liability for any consequences. National hard law might attach when the client follows religiously the great corporate lawyer's advice on soft law. What do I mean? I'll give you an example. British courts heard a number of cases recently in which the complainants alleged that a British parent company should be held liable for environmental damages caused by a foreign subsidiary because the parent has a duty of care vis-a-vis -vis the persons damaged by the subsidiary. In the most recent case, Lungowi versus Vedanta Resources PLC, the British Supreme Court held that a duty of care which establishes the competence of British courts is conceivable because the parent company stressed in its sustainability report that it steers and controls the compliance with environmental regulation in the entire corporate group, inter alia, through uniform CSR policies and intensive trainings throughout the group and substantial influence on the management of the subsidiaries. This is, however, what the UNGP's due diligence scheme requires. If you were the great corporate lawyer who advised the client to do exactly that, you should better contact your professional liability insurance. <laughs> I recently had a case in which a chemical multinational enterprise drafted a human rights policy in which it promised to ensure that it will neither cause nor contribute nor be directly linked to any negative human rights impact in its whole supply chain. Again, this is what the UNGPs recommend. 
The multinational enterprise had approximately 100,000 first tier suppliers alone. This is mission impossible. Why? Because it will never be capable to control 24 hours a day and seven days a week the entire supply chain in order to live up to this promise. Such a policy could invite claims against the company based on unfair competition, like the famous Nike case and comparable cases in Europe. In addition, any chem chemical company has a lot of negative human rights impacts. They are, however, not human rights violations when they are allowed by national laws and state permits. If you're an environmental lawyer advising such a client to obtain a permit, you're simply doing your job. But in terms of the UNGP, you might be considered to be contributing to negative human rights impacts, even if the client does the utmost to avoid the emissions. This raises the question, and John and I had intensive discussions on that, whether the UNGP and other CSR norms can be applied one-to-one -to, -one to lawyers and law firms. And the answer, also reflected in the IBA practical guidance on business and human rights for lawyers, um, and in the guidances of the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, the CCPE on CSR, is no. Why? Also, in principle, there is agreement that the legal profession can and should make significant contribution to human rights and sustainability. The devil is in the detail. There are challenges and unresolved questions, such as, is advice on CSR soft law norms legal advice? Is soft law law in that sense? May or must lawyers advise on CSR soft law? Is it covered by their professional insurance at all? What kind of CSR responsibilities apply or may be imposed on lawyers and to what extent? By whom? By their clients? By professional organizations? By the state? Do they have to be modified to comply with professional confidentiality rules and with the human right to access to justice? How far can there be responsibility for clients' behavior taking into consideration the independence of the legal profession, which is indispensable for the administration of law? What about conflicting codes of conduct of law firms and their various clients? The legal profession is called upon by professional organizations like the IBA, the CCPE, and national bars, as well as by their clients to bear responsibility for human rights and the environment in four capacities. We've heard some of them already. One, as enterprises. Two, Larry mentioned that, as gatekeepers. Three, as supplier of services. And four, as advisors. Let me touch briefly on these four aspects. First, law firm as enterprises. Law firms are enterprises in the sense of all international CSR norms, such as the UN Global Compact, UNGP, OECD guidelines on multinational enterprises. The European Commission stipulated that compliance with applicable laws and regulations is the minimum responsibility. For lawyers, this includes compliance with bar rules, the CCPE Charter for, of core principles of the European legal profession, and the Code of Conduct for European lawyers, covering only the economic and governance side of lawyers' responsibilities, partly further spelled out by guidances, for example, on anti-money laundering, anti-corruption, or insider trading. Some law firms have signed the UN Global Compact. Some start to develop CSR policies or publish an annual CSR or sustainability reports dealing with their internal issues, such as employee health and well-being, gender and diversity issues, and environmental enhancements. Pro bono advice and activities are an established element of law firm CSR, particularly important for the human right of access to justice in countries which do not have a legal aid system. Two, lawyers as gatekeepers of their clients. There have been in the past already intensive discussions 
whether and to what extent lawyers should be gatekeepers of their clients. This can undermine the lawyer's role as trusted advisor. Concerning anti-corruption and anti-money laundering, a gatekeeper role has been acknowledged and law firms run know your customer policies. Regarding the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, Larry, you have published on that, the gatekeeper role was hotly disputed between the US government and the European bars. Now we see NGOs raising far-reaching duties for law firms to examine, influence, and sanction a client who has or may have a negative human rights impact. It is an established rule that a lawyer may not aid and abet a client in illegal behavior. The claims of NGOs to hold lawyers accountable for negative impacts on human rights caused by their clients or even the opposite party to which they contribute or are directly linked through their legal advice in the widest sense go, however, much further. The CCBE and IBL, I, IBA held that such wide accountability can conflict, on the one hand, with the role of the attorney as advisor and supplier of services to the client, and on the other hand, the attorney has a crucial function in the day-to-day -day operation of the rule of law. As advisor and supplier of services, the attorney depends on the client's definition of the scope of work. The attorney has an advisory role, which means that the client may or may not follow its advice. If the client asks the attorney to restrict her advice to hard law, for example, whether the operation is compliant with applicable environmental laws, there is little that the attorney can do about it. In addition, the attorney has a crucial role in the promotion and implementation of the rule of law. One of the basic human rights is access to justice, which means that every person is entitled to be represented by a lawyer and that the lawyer has a role on his own, distinct and independent from the client's conduct. Due to this official function, the attorney is subject to specific bar regulations, in particular to confidentiality requirements, the attorney-client uh, privilege, limitations regarding the termination of the client relationship, and under certain conditions, even the obligation to, the obligation to represent a client in court. Even massive violators of human rights, such as mass murderers, are entitled to legal representation and a far fair trial. Three law firms as supplier of services. As supplier of services, lawyers and law firms are increasingly asked to sign the client's code of conduct as part of the retainer agreement. The CCPE discussed a number of crucial and yet run unresolved questions. One, how do you avoid becoming subject to a multiplicity of potentially conflicting policies of various clients. Take mother law firms. I'm um, I adhere to Dentons with 10, more than 10,000 lawyers, um, the largest law firm in the world. If every lawyer has only 10 clients, Dentons would be subject to 100,000 client requests to sign their code of conduct, usually applicable to all firm members and all matters worldwide. This is obviously not feasible. Thus, a number of law firms make their life easy, at least at first, by following a we sign everything strategy. The better strategy is, however, to develop a CSR policy on your own, adapted to the specific requirements of the professional role, and ask the client to accept it as equivalent to its own policy. Second question, is a client request to audit the law firm's compliance with his code of conduct feasible at all? Such requests to check the law firm's books and records may contradict confidentiality rules. Third, it is not unusual that a client asks a law firm to sign its code of conduct containing such nice provisions like no excessive working hours, which conflict, on the other hand, with the client's demand to have round-the-clock negotiations or amend drafts over the weekend. The law firm is usually in an impossible conflict 
and technically speaking in a breach of the retainer agreement and will usually have to disregard the code of conduct to get the deal done. Four and last point, lawyers at advisor, as advisors. We touched already briefly on the role as law of lawyers as advisors and their unique position to advise on soft law and its hard law impl implications and consequences. CSR triggered in Europe and in Germany fundamental questions such as is advice on CSR norms legal advice? Is soft law law in that sense? May or must lawyers advise on CSR soft law? Is it covered by the professional insurance? These questions are not solved yet in Europe and in Germany. Anglo-American insurance policies often cover risk management and advice on CSR is considered to fall into this category. European policies, however, uh, usually don't, which triggers the so far unresolved question, is advice on soft law legal advice? Is it law or otherwise part of the usual attor attorney's scope of work as defined by the bar associations? In Germany, we are discussing with the insurance companies whether separate coverage is needed in order to advise on CSR norms. Without insurance coverage and taking into consideration the uncertainties connected with the new area of CSR soft law, it is quite risky to render advice. Another question also still unresolved is whether attorneys may or must advise on CSR soft law. This is a matter of the definition of the scope of an attorney's activities usually defined in the bar rules. May, most likely, uh, yes, but must. If CSR soft law develops a standard of care that informs tort or criminal law, most likely, yes. If it is separate, like in the OECD guidelines on multinational enterprises and NCP procedures, the lawyer should clarify in the retainer agreement whether such advice on soft law shall be covered. It might be advisable to limit the lawyer's liability for CSR-related advice to a certain amount, taking into consideration the significant uncertainties connected therewith. The CCPE and the national bars are called upon to develop further guidance on these issues and provide clarification in the bar rules. It is, however, a slow process. Last not least, because there is intensive resistance to accept that in a globalized world, the good old national and EU laws and international treaties are not sufficient anymore to steer transnational issues such as global business, digitalization, and climate change. In addition, the political position of the bars, of the European bars, no more rules on the bar, is widespread. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all our panelists. There's a lot of information there. Um, <laughs> and just to note, um, and I think why, why I really wanted to have this conversation here, this is uh, very much a new and early stages conversation globally and really not something that we have reflected on very much at all in the Canadian context, a little bit here and there. Um, and there's obviously a lot to think about. Um, at this point, let's turn it over to you and see if there are any uh, questions. Maybe I could get a sense of if there are a lot of questions up front, small number of questions. There's some, yeah, there's a good number of questions. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna dive into the questions then, and then possibly at the end, I'm gonna ask um, the speakers to, ref to offer some reflections themselves on what they heard from the others. Um, so maybe I'll start at this end. Just start. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Salvador Herencia from the University of Ottawa. And I think my question is to go over the table because we all address wonderful different elements regarding the legal profession. I would just like to see many of your calls, and I, I like your ethics as duty, the, the last part. In a way, not only for the professional, but also for state attorneys litigating the human rights right? right? Uh, at the end, I think, from a human rights perspective, or from, from my perspective, I see that this is 
fostering a different view of how the law is and what the law should be. And how can we do this? What are the challenges that this present, for example, in a Canadian context where two weeks ago the Law Society of Ontario revoked the rule to promote diversity in its bar members? So, so this presents, a, we're talking about challenges on how to promote diversity, how to see our, 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 our the legal profession, not something as I will defend my client as hell freezes over, which is a statement that the attorney for a Chevron tech cycle made in the, in the case of the here in Canada, when in practice we're seeing that law societies are more reluctant or are trying to revoke or consider putting into debate the derogation of this type of norms that promote diversity, inclusion, and different views of the law. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I'm just going to, because not all of the panelists are aware of this, there was, this is um, a development under the Ontario um, Bar, so they changed the name of it from the Law Society of Upper Canada, and I can't remember what it's actually called now, but it's the Ontario Law Society of, Law Society of Ontario. I should know I'm a member. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Law Society of Ontario. Um, but there was an initiative to have um, to have as part of the code that there would that law firms would promote diversity within the profession. Then there was an election, a complete change of people involved. This was revoked, and what was put in place was something uh, that is very much about uh, what lawyers will do is respect Ontario human rights law, which I think gets precisely to the point in a sense of, of, of some of our conversations. Um, Larry, I think the question was possibly aimed at you more, but any general? Any, any, would anyone like to reflect on the ethics piece or? All right, all right, all right. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, this, all right. There's an easy answer and there's a harder answer. Um, the easy answer is grounded in an orthodoxy of views of what the moral requirements of a society ought to be, in which case you're absolutely right and the duty must be to further it. But here's the problem with multi-directional and multi-vector moral and societal orders. They sometimes don't align. <laughs> And now you've got a problem, right? And now you've got a problem. If, in fact, we are committed to openness and diversity, and we are committed to the notion that there is no single moral order whose orthodoxy can be ascribed down to the most granular level, then we have to think about the ethics of conversations among them. In this case, this is not a great case for that, um, because what they've done is this, it, I don't know your, all, all your business, but um, it, it, what it appears from, from this is that you've taken a great principle, you've gotten rid of it, and you say, ah, there's no principle, and say, what we're going to do is, com is comply with the law, whatever that means. But effectively, what they're saying is, we reject the principle, but we're not putting anything in its place. Right? And in, from an uh, ethical perspective of duty, that's wrong. But, and that's the harder part of the answer, what happens if there is a counter that indeed the notion, a deeply felt and moral view, that the notion of diversity is itself divisive, and that, the, that diversity is itself symptomatic of a larger moral issue to which we ought to work at rather than to the uh, fixing of its symptoms by counting heads. Now you've got a different problem, right? And where you've got multiple moralities, each of which might require respect. And now ethics takes a different a, a different form. And now you're going to have to deal with the uh, the art of communication, for which I have no answer. And Penelope, I think, wants to. No. No. Oh, no. oh. Just okay. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay. <laughs> I want to respond to that. Uh, yes. So just she. one one additional comment in your. I think if I understood your question correctly, we are just moving in the opposite direction because the one of the basic questions is what does respect of human rights mean? 
and break that down into specific issues. So we are discussing at the CCP now, um, shall we have a kind of a, a guidance, specific guidance on diversity, just to break it down and make it more specific and concrete. Next question, can we have to do? Uh, sure. So this is a question for Larry. I think I know what you were getting at, but I'm curious to hear you uh, expand on it. You said in the climate context, five years from now, ethics, ethical rules, ethical norms would be a, sh a sword, not a shield. I'd be interested to, if I understood you correctly, I'd be interested to hear what you mean by that. OK. It, it, all right, so I'm, I'm putting on my hat as a prognosticator. Uh, which means that I'm going to be 120% wrong. That's okay. All right, all right, all right. All right. Uh, all right. So when you're dealing with climate, uh, what you're dealing with is, in, if you take it all, and again, I'm going to put my foot in it, so please forgive me, and, and y'all can mean that. You're, you're, what you're seeing ultimately is a radical transformation of the way in which we understand uh, both social organization and the role that laws and social actors play within it, moving from perspectives of, of, of individuality, of division, to one of interconnection. And it's not for nothing that the Sustainable Development Goals include 16 very intimately interconnected things. You can't take one apart and then deal with it and say you solved it. That requires a radical reorientation of the way in which not only uh, social and economic and political actors approach the issue of their activities, but the way in which lawyers approach their advice to clients much more collectively, much more holistically. You cannot solve a problem by cabining it. And it's, it's the notion, how do you solve the problem of moral responsibility where you live in a regime where in order to minimize my liability in a cab company, I can create a holding company and then incorporate each of my 16 cab companies so that I will never be exposed to more than 10,000, a famous case in the US, more than $10,000 in liability for each of my cabs, right? Climate is really the, it's a metaphor for a significant change that, that isn't just about climate, but it's the way in which we order our, our society. And that will have ramifications everywhere, including basic ramifications in all of our core areas. Uh, everything from asset partitioning and uh, the protection and the, the uh, compartmentalization of liability to uh, the way in which we understand separation of powers and cooperation, to the way in which we understand decision making, to the way in which we understand property. Mm -hmm. So I think I've pronounced it enough. Yeah. Now, if he didn't. No, I'm no, not, not trying to follow Larry. Because, but uh, <laughs> just, just to say that uh, there's, a, there's an interesting quote from David Lubin, who's, who's talking about uh, professional responsibility and making, considering all the moral arguments in favor of the adversary system. And one of the things he says is that when serious moral obligation conflicts with professional obligation, the lawyer must become a civil disobedient to professional rules. And I think that maybe that captures what will happen with climate change, where if we do not progress in our, in our ethical appro approaches uh, at, you know, in, in law societies, etc., that uh, we will have to then have lawyers who are actually starting to say. Because when you have these serious moral uh, questions or serious moral obligations, um, uh, you know, people are going to have to be starting to step out in order to address them. Well, let me jump in on this one. Um, because I didn't have an immediate answer to what I heard both of you. Um, but I think that it's important to recognize that the role of lawyers and businesses has changed and is changing over the years. And the old paradigm was that if you had a really serious problem uh, involving strategic issues for the company, you go to your house, you go to a big law firm, uh, and uh, you get the advice of the top lawyer. Um, that's changed over the last 10 years, uh, 15 years, um, and it's the locus as uh, power has shifted to the in-house council. Uh, ben Heinemann uh, has uh, written books on this. The Harvard Center for the Legal Profession uh, has, has done really good work on this. And what this means is that now for the very best and brightest business lawyers, 
are expected to act as partners with senior management and the board in managing strategic risk for the, for the company. I was an in-house lawyer and I would find myself at a board meeting and offering advice and I, every once in a while I'll say, is that legal advice? Um, is it, am I, am I, you know, am I just give, shooting off my own opinion or am I trying to take my role as a lawyer and then looking forward to climate change issues as, as a potential risk five years, ten years, or a year in the future? And what am I, how, how do I factor that into my legal advice? Or, or am I just simply talking uh, about what's in the best interest of the of a company. It's very hard in that situation. And that is now the paradigm in which lawyers, the ones that businesses pay attention to, find themselves. Um, and, and I think that may be kind of what Larry is, is getting at. But I won't put words in Larry's mouth because that's a problem. Yeah, yeah, I think there is also, in the Paris Agreement, I think you open up, also the, the legal side is opening up uh, to have this kind of transnationalization of law, that it's not the law and, uh, and legal instruments anymore uh, which are relevant, but it's a whole array of instruments and a whole array actually of steering mechanisms. And I think this is the point where lawyers have to adapt to this kind of new and wider definition of law or alternative instruments. So uh, thank you for a wonderful conversation. Um, so uh, our last speaker summarized the, the four roles that the panelists uh, spoke about uh, of lawyers. So as enterprises, gatekeepers, suppliers of services, uh, as advisors. And I want to suggest that maybe that is an incomplete list for some problems and in some contexts. So let me give you some concrete examples. Um, in Nigeria, lawyers sue Shell in the ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West Africa uh, Community Court of Justice, even though it's an international court where only, uh, where you could only sue a state, not a multinational corporation. Why would they be doing that? They're basically going against what the plot level law says. In East Africa, uh, lawyers use a trip court that has no jurisdiction over human rights to bring the types of cases that we've spoken about here being brought in Canada and other places. Now, one might say that those lawyers are really in violation of their professional responsibilities because the rules don't allow them to do that. But surprisingly, in each of those contexts, uh, those lawyers are actually doing a very well trodden, uh, following a very well trodden path that lawyers have followed for some problems in some contexts where they challenge the structure because it doesn't accommodate what they'd like to achieve. And so I'd like to suggest that perhaps there's another model of rebellious wiring mm -hmm. that crosses boundaries. Uh, and in East Africa and most of West Africa, this is actually showing success. The lawyers have pushed in West Africa for that court to hear human rights cases, not against international corporations. Although I can tell you there are many benefits for bringing a case against Shell in the Ecowas Court, as opposed to the Supreme Court of the United States. In East Africa, that court has now jurisdiction, has opened up in a way that it never opened up because business was not interested in going there. So I, I'd like to suggest that there are, other, there are many other instances in which rebellious wiring as a model uh, should be embraced and that we shouldn't sort of just be confined to the niceties of the rules of professional responsibility, mm -hmm. which are nothing against, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Reflections, Penelope? So, I think that's a really very interesting uh, point that you made and, uh, and very interesting too of what, what the lawyers have done there. I just wanted to kind of uh, bring up the issue of, of what is a serious moral, um, uh, moral issue that might require a lawyer to be disobedient of his profession. And I, I think you know, climate change is a very obvious one. It, it is becoming a very obvious one now because it is considered an emergency that will affect the whole planet. But there's also, uh, I think, the issue of just the human rights impact of business activity, which, in, which includes you know, a lot of the things that contribute to climate change and, and not uh, you know, you know, assisting corporations to act in ways that are unsustainable. 
Uh, and I think that that has to be, you know, for a rebellious lawyer, something that they need to think about as well. Uh, is this another serious moral issue? Uh, do we, and I don't know, I don't, you know, I haven't really thought through how you would, how you would sort of connect that with professional responsibility. But, um, uh, but, but I think that that, that that is another context that is sort of more under the wire because we don't see or hear about it every day. We aren't witnessing the changes in the climate, uh, you know, around the country and around the world. Um, you know, in the context of business and human rights, for example, and, and the, the types of abuses and grave abuses that are, that are happening. If I could follow up on that, uh, because it makes me think of something that hasn't come up uh, in the discussion so far relating to professional responsibilities of a lawyer, and it relates to the rebellious lawyer, it relates to the point that Penelope just made, and it is so lit litigation, okay, it's generally, you have preventative lawyers and you have litigators. Litigators are the, are the guard dogs. And preventative ones try to keep companies out of trouble. And then they, and the preventative lawyers run into the rebellious lawyers on the other side representing uh, people who need access to remedy. And one of the responses of business lawyers is something called slap suits. These are strategic, this is called strategic litigation against public participation. The whole goal is not to win the suit, but to make the costs of bringing suits so egregious uh, that um, you just you give up uh, at the outset. Because who's, who can who can fund it? And I think that this is this was something that started in the United States um, and is spread all over the world. So every time you have a rebellious lawyer, and I I applaud that because I think. Lawyers have to be rebellious uh, at times. You have uh, it's matched by some fairly unethical behavior on the part of businesses, and I don't think that the discussion today has really drawn that out. Mm -hmm. um, has 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 drawn the parameters of what is a slap suit? It's it's just the side of of frivolous. It's got enough to to survive a motion to dismiss, but it's real intent. Is to, is, is to punish the other side. The best example of that is um, Chevron in Texaco, where, where Texaco brought what everybody thought was a slap suit, a RICO claim, organized crime claim, against the plaintiff's lawyer. And then suddenly, through, through discovery, they found, they found facts to substantiate that the lawyer had been, had been uh, uh, bribing the judges who were making the award. And that has made it very difficult to fight slap suits now. Um, I don't know uh, what your experience is like with that, but it's, it's something that really needs to be brought up. Bridget? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, I think, John, what you're raising is something uh, very, uh, we don't see that in such a way in Europe at the moment, not yet. I think it's coming over, um, uh, but uh, what we understand as strategic litigation is the opposite. Uh, that we see in particular in climate change um, context, increasingly litigation which is using, for example, tort concepts in very creative and innovative ways. For example, we have uh, one case uh, in, Ger in Germany at the moment pending where a Peruvian um, um, uh, peasant is actually suing a German energy company because uh, the, the German energy company has emitted a certain amount of uh, climate gases uh, over time and this is causing a glacier in Peru to, to melt and the melting can cause actually um, uh, damaging of this peasant. So um, this was is totally new. So um, I think it's not only rebellious, we see, to, to put it in, in other terms, innovative lawsuits, in particular in climate education, where we see also strategic litigation of NGOs. Also, it might be difficult to really win the case. It wins an enormous amount of publicity. And already amount, winning that amount of publicity is already half of the, um, the goal, so to speak, they, they try to achieve. So I think it works both ways. And Germany, we see more the other uh, type of strategic litigation. Mm -hmm. Penelope? Uh, 
Oh, I think actually I just was at another conference in the UK and somebody presented a paper on slap suits uh, in Europe but it was in France. Mm -hmm. And there have been a lot of uh, suits been brought, have been brought against Sherpa, which is a, an NGO that regularly um, tries to hold corporations to account through lawsuits. Uh, and was actually very, very involved in bringing the uh, French law of vigilance into, into being. Uh, and they have, I think there's been an ongoing case uh, against them for 10 years it's, and it's, uh, it's been good. And they are dogged, so, for, and very brave, I think. Um, but but there, I think there, it is starting to happen, mm -hmm. maybe not to the same extent. In Germany, yeah, we don't, sure. I don't, I'm not aware of any case uh, yeah. of this quality. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware of that. Mm -hmm. Just a very minor point on the, the rebellious lawyering, which is all cool. Rebellious lawyering, I think, is, is strategically useful and effective, but only within a social, uh, a social legal order that finds a space for it. My caution is that not all societies are as open in their own contextually relevant way as perhaps Nigeria or Canada or France that when you're dealing especially in production chains that uh, travel down into Marxist-Leninist countries, for example, and into certain other countries, rebellious lawyering is not only dangerous for the lawyer, but is likely to have reverberations and consequences which are much greater than merely shutting the lawyer down. So one ought to be careful here, especially when one is dealing in intrasystemic ethical possibilities and strategic behaviors about constraints and sometimes quite severe ones that may come up within uh, different uh, uh, legal and, and social orders, and particularly in Marxist-Leninist states. Other question? Yes. Keith. Uh, uh, Keith Munzer, HDK. Sure. I'll talk a little about the lit litigation context. The question is more in kind of a regulatory context uh, in terms of ethics. Um, when we're talking about something like the softball, say like the CPB store, that companies are, are adopting into their sustainability reports or, and by reference into the annual reports, which are part of public disclosure, MDNA and that kind of stuff, and potentials for liabilities from soft law devices around there. And if they are potentially liable, is there now a chance for them to start saying less and less, or if they have a new CSR uh, supply chain management score by saying we're not going to do anything, all of a sudden if there's a liability, are they going to start going back to the old ways and say nothing again? Or even going worse, to start lobbying or advocating to regulatory authorities, say like Ontario Securities Commission or the TSX, to not make laws more stringent or not increase disclosures or going back and going into the reverse? Is there any potential around there? Yeah, I, oh, go ahead. I'm just going to briefly, for the sake of people who might listen to this later, uh, attempt to say what that question was for the, into the mic. So um, Keith is asking about um, reporting of climate, climate disclosures in, in particular CDP and, and in other contexts and what the, what the implications of uh, those might be for uh, responsible lawyering. Um, John. Yeah, I, I, I think the horse has already left the barn on this issue. And, and to me, the, the thing to keep your eye on is the spectacular growth of funds that use ESG factors. Um, it, it's gone up even after Trump was, uh, was elected. There was a so-called Trump bump in which, uh, uh, which investors were saying, well, now it's up, up to businesses to uh, manage their risks for themselves because you can't look to at least the U.S. government to do so. Um, and ESG, obviously, for climate change, there's there uh, fits in the E, but it also fits in the S in a big way. And I think there's a lack of conceptual understanding for, for the S. So, so you have investor pressure that is going to make it very hard to turn the clock back. In my view. I think one of the crucial issues are what does ESG exactly mean, and there are uh, there are a lot of different uh, actually interpretations by different banks and different standards. Uh, so there is no uniform standard at the moment. We are discussing in the European Union a taxonomy system 
uh, to be introduced by uh, a European um, um, uh, regulation. Uh, but the devil is also in the detail there, what is really sustainable and what they, they started off only with environmental and climate change issues and they wanted to adopt only or take into consideration only then the core labor norms and now they are shifting maybe also to the UNGP, etc. But, you know, the, 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 the devil is really there in the detail and also uh, the question which we are discussing in Europe is does it make sense to freeze a situation? Because whenever you introduce a regulation, meaning hard law, you are freezing to a certain extent as a status quo uh, in a situation where a lot of development is happening. So the question is also what is the right instrument at this stage of the development? And I'm personally very reluctant, also the impetus is good, uh, and we need to really define that in order to make it comparable, but uh, it has its disadvantages because the next review shall be in two or three years, and uh, also you are not flexible enough to, um, uh, to combine social issues, environmental issues, integrity issues, they are all interconnected, and when you take only one part, the environmental part, and then a little bit of social things. Uh, is this really sustainable? I think I have certain doubts. Any other outstanding questions at this point? Sarah, I just have yes. one, one thing to, to add to that. I think it has an impact, uh, it could have also an impact in the litigation sense. So the Vendata, Vendata case that you talked about is an example where um, you know corporations are talking about the environmental policy and they're pushed to do that by investors, etc. Uh, and uh, but then it comes back to bite them in litigation because then it shows that the parent company is actually directing the group, which they don't. They like to still pretend that they're all these separate legal entities that are. One thing. So I think it, I think that you, you kind of wonder in some of these cases if you if you do establish parent company liability. Um, in, in, a group, in a bunch of jurisdictions, is that going to mean that companies are going to be less likely to develop, um, you know, uh, human rights policies, uh, and, you know, like climate change policies like that, uh, that are public? I think those are all excellent and important questions and the things that we're struggling with. I just wanted, for people who are, um, perhaps not familiar also with the terminology. I just wanted to uh, note that we have thrown out a lot of acronyms. So ESG is often environmental, social, and governance factors. The SDGs, of course, are the Sustainable Development Goals. BHR is Business and Human Rights. <laughs> RBC is Responsible Business Conduct. Uh, <laughs> there's a few others in there, sustainability, and depending on which sort of institution and mechanism you're looking at, they're going to be using different terminology to talk about sort of the same stuff, but in kind of different ways, which is part of the problem. Um, and so on that note, um, I think it's probably, we've had a very good session, time to call it to a close. I just want to note that um, for anybody who's particularly excited about climate change and lawyer responsibilities and those sort of things, I'm going to attempt to have a bit of a discussion as part of our um, SDGs and business regulation con uh, conference tomorrow at 11 o'clock or so in room 204 on business, res business responsibilities and lawyer responsibilities for climate justice. I don't actually know what we're going to talk about yet, um, but I'm hoping that this will have given me some ideas and hopefully our panelists will have some too. So on that note, thank you so much for coming and for speaking and um, thank you.